So um, now we're going to uh, our third speaker, who is Mr. Uh, Jerry Lakula. Do I pronounce it correctly? Correct, correct. Okay. Um, he's a human rights activist, and um, he was formerly a human rights officer of the United Nations mission in South Sudan, and amongst his initiatives there was the Girl to Child uh, Education Act, which he, uh, he promoted, um, and uh, this guaranteed the right of girls to education. One of the big successes of the UN system, I might say, is girls' education. Um, before that, he was working at the Independent National Commission on the Human Rights of the Republic of Liberia and the Trauma Healing and Reconciliation Program of the Lutheran Church in Liberia. And he's the founder and CEO of the Lakula Foundation, a non-profit organization which promotes social justice, human rights, and empowering communities in Liberia. So let me hand over to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to say special thanks to Ido and his team here for inviting me. And again, the usual disclaimer, I'm glad I don't work right now for any organization. Uh, so what I say here is purely going to be my own uh, opinion and responsibility. So but it's so nice to note that uh, this is a very small world. Uh, somebody get fat at my back, and that was Ophelia. She said, I think we were in one ministry in Juba. I said, yeah, okay, that's true. So, Ophelia, nice to meet you. <laughs> so, that's how our world is, 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 is small. Yeah, she was working there for one Israel aid organization, and we used to, most of the time, get uh, to them when we were doing advocacy in most of our projects. So many thanks to everybody, and I'm going to be super fast uh, because Thank most you. of what I got organized here have already been said oh. by my colleagues. Um, other in peacekeeping mission, all in aid operation, SEA has been and remains a very, very big problem. From 2003 to 2005 to 2007 and up to 2010, sexual exploitation abuse in peacekeeping operation or aid operation were very alarming. We know that they are still alarming, but those days they were very, very terrible. Especially during the UN peacekeeping mission in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Cote d'Ivoire. Particularly in Liberia, I remember where uh, Romanians, uh, sorry for mentioning the names, people from Bulgaria and other European countries. They were either evacuated or repatriated as early as possible when there were cases of SEA against them. And there were no measures of accountability. And today the frameworks uh, that the United Nations has today mainly came from those cases, from Liberia, from Sierra Leone, and there were many lessons learned that today we got a lot of frameworks from the United Nations coming on. But again, despite these frameworks, it still remains a very, very big problem. Uh, speaking about the UN project or program or mission in South Sudan, where we had the UN country team, UN agencies, funds and programs, we worked together in the context of human rights, but also talking about SEA. As part of the as part of the, the measures, uh, when when both civilian and military have gone uh, personnel have gone for induction, we got the conduct and discipline team on the team on in the field that also provide training, <coughs> awareness for the military and non-military personnel, so that uh, they are cognizant and they are aware of the situation in the field. And for the uniformed personnel, the language is absolutely prohibited when it comes to the to, to SEA. It's absolutely prohibited. For civilian, it says uh, strongly discouraged. That's the language that is spoken. But coming back to our context, sexual exploitation and abuse undermine the credibility of peacekeeping operation and humanitarian aid whether big or small, or in small cities, in village, or in town. 
Sexual exploitation and abuse also does not only expose the level of vulnerability of the victims, that is the already affected population, and destroys their sense of dignity, but it's, it also is, is an affront to the policies, these very frameworks that we are talking about. For the USAID, sexual exploitation and abuse occurs when people in power exploit or abuse vulnerable population for sexual purposes. And of course, she said it as part of the UN framework, according to the United Nations bulletin, uh, sexual exploitation and abuse Sexual as refers to the actual or attempted. So it could be actual, it could also be attempted. Like I said, most of these have already been said, so I want to quickly run over them. <laughs> Perpetrators of sexual exploitation abuse get to destroy the entity they work for, like in the context of UN, and this is why investigation must be done from the UN perspective in order to bring uh, for the measures of accountability, and also the, the current measures by the UN is talking that is more laying on the side of victims' assistance other than just uh, uh, concentrating on on the issue of accountability, but then leaving the victim is going to be victim center as well. The the ultra also has come up with with an ultra has a framework, and it says that the the, the, the involvement of humanitarian workers in act of sexual exploitation and abuse is a grave violation of our responsibility to do no harm and protect the affected uh, population. But in the context of, of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, sexual exploitation and abuse by UN peacekeepers, uh, m members or non-UN uh, international security forces operating under the UN Security Council mandate and indeed any UN personnel, military or civilian betrayed the DPS value of our uh, organization. Of, of course, it also talks about the victim center here. Uh, on the ultra, they, 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 they are introducing or they has a mechanism that has to do with the proactive and comprehensive uh, manner in which to handle this. And one of these has to do with, uh, or the outline has to do with screening before sending uh, uh, peacekeepers or civilian personnel in the field. They want to do, uh, they are introduced screening. And it also has to do with staff training. This is why we said in the context of the UN peacekeeping mission, like on base in South Sudan, both civilian and military personnel had to go through training or about SEA, what constitutes at SEA, and so forth. And also raising awareness in the public in the context of SEA, especially for the for the for the beneficiaries, for the population, and conducting risk assessment. This is why even in the context of the peacekeeping mission, we also have UNDSS, they usually do risk assessment in, in, in for, for the UN's peace, peacekeeping so that so that they get to know how, how polarized or how how the community looks like before even trying to talk about deployment. And these are all part of the framework that uh, we they, they are talking that we are talking about. So I will skip all of these and just quickly run over one of these issues that has to do with I know we know about the um, Terrain case, a, a number of us heard about the Terrain case. The Terrain case is about a case in South Sudan where in 2016, January 11, uh, not January, July 11, uh, soldiers belonging to the, to the government of South Sudan went into this Terrain uh, hotel and, and, and killed a journalist, but then gang raped uh, a number of international aid workers uh, in, in that compound, looted the entire compound. <coughs> so what I'm trying to bring to our attention here is that uh, this is one of the cases where not necessarily SEA but rape, but also uh, uh, let's say war crime uh, in the context of conflict related sexual violence committed by, uh, by state agents. This is one of the cases where state have taken measures in order to uh, for their soldiers or their agents to give uh, for, for some measures of accountability. But even though it has some loopholes, it was highly criticized uh, because uh, this day was political because there were a lot of eyebrows raised. Why is it only this terrain case? Is it because the victims are white people or the government is doing so in order to, 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 how to, cut it, to gain favor from the Europeans or from the Americans and so forth? But interestingly, at the end of the day, in September last year, 10 of these soldiers were, were, were sentenced to Virok, I mean to jail, Virok jail terms, including uh, seven years and even uh, life imprisonment. So that was a very good uh, a measure taken by the, by the state. But interestingly, uh, where the, this, this, this incident occurred and the UN peacekeeping compound, where just a stone throw, it's not even quite a mile, 
But there was coal, there were cries, UN peacekeeper Chinese at the Indian sat by and just did not do anything to rescue these people. Um, I wanted to quickly uh, go and talk about, especially the Liberian case, so that I quickly conclude. When question comes, that would be fine. In Liberia, in 2007, we know that two soldiers serving the OMIL, OMIL was, it was the United Nations mission in Liberia, were repatriated to their respective countries. And this is one of the cases, I think if they had several, I don't know, but this is the two that we, we came across, where two of these soldiers were repatriated to their respective countries because they were, they were, they were allegation of SEA against them, but OMIL were able to, to, to investigate and they were found guilty, but they were repatriated to their home, I mean, to their countries. But like she said, other countries will say that uh, these are crimes that were committed, I mean, across our borders, so we don't want to prosecute any of our uh, citizens for such a crime. So, so far, I want to stop there so that if there'll be other questions, we can handle that, but uh, that was uh, what I wanted to talk about briefly. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Thank you very much.